here you can see my, uh, my, my, my life. I started in uh, studies in Braunschweig, Maschinenbau. Then I went to Mercedes-Benz, uh, engine manufacturing, um, the engine factory in Mannheim for heavy duty trucks, industrial engines. Then I went to a consultant company, Roland Berger in Germany. Then I was uh, in a yeah, more or less consumer uh, products range for lawnmowers. I also was the biggest customer of Briggs & Stratton in Europe. Then I went into a, a small company which makes automotive uh, components. And at least um, I joined 2007 the Bücker Group. Uh, the Bücker Group has uh, one of the biggest uh, engine remanufacturing plants in Germany. I stayed there more than eight years. Then this company was sold and I joined a Chinese company. The Chinese company is Uchai, in, um, or the full name is U Guangxi Uchai Machinery. Um, it is one of the biggest engine manufacturer in uh, China for heavy duty diesel engines and gas engines. And uh, also since uh, 2014, I'm the president of the Engine Remanufacturing Association in Europe. So um, I will show you what our organization will do. We are founded 1959 in Vienna, 58 in Vienna. We have around 10 associations in Europe and we are the roof or let's say the umbrella association of these 10 associations. We also have some corporate members like the company Vito Bello, which is also here at the moment. Um, and we have around, let's say, it's, it's very pending on, the, on what you count, between, let's say, between 500 and 800 companies in Europe are direct or indirect member in our association. What we do, we defend the interest of our industry, um, mainly small and medium members, so we don't have so much large uh, companies, but I will show you this later. We are promoting the commun communication among our members, <coughs> communication to the government, to the EU government, and so on, and to other associations. So we have some tools and services. We are more or less a spokesman for the European engine remanufacturing uh, and rebuilders. Uh, we have um, access to policy makers and to institutions, uh, to universities, and so on. We have a firm website where we present our activities. Uh, we have a, um, a newsletter which is issued two times a month and we have in every Rematech news a page, it's called the blue page, where firm uh, announces some interesting topics of our branch. Um, I, I'm also, together with Volker Schittenhelm, my um, communication officer of firm, in the Rematech committee. Rematech is a very important show for remanufacturing and we have a strong position as engine remanufacturers in this Rematech show. It's uh, every second year in June in Amsterdam and I really strongly recommend that if you have time you should go there. It's a three-day uh, exhibition. It is not only automotive. I will later talk about our topic that we as engine rebuilders do not have to concentrate only on automotive. We also have to focus on industrial engines like uh, power generation, marine and so on. And this Rematech show is for everything. It's as well as automotive, is as well as industrial. Also wind turbines are now a topic and it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, our activities, we are supporting the campaign Right to Repair from FIJEFA, it's a parts um, association in Europe. We are attending 3R conferences worldwide. We are working on common definitions about remanufacturing. KONAREM also uh, was asked to agree on common worldwide definitions of remanufacturing. We did this together with KLEPA and our sister association APRA, the Automotive Parts Remanufacturing Association, which is also international. We are sharing our secretary together, so we work very close together with the APRA. So uh, our today's working issues are emissions. Um, in Europe we have now very strong regulations about emissions. I will talk about this also later. Uh, we want to have an influence. Uh, every topic which is um, related to engine remanufacturing has to be uh, concerned also in the, in the EU law. So our, our mission is um, yeah, to make awareness and promote the engine remanufacturing. 
uh, to fulfill the international requirements uh, of associated remanufacturers, to inform about international issues, strategic st changes, laws, uh, regulations, and to contribute to policy making uh, processes uh, of international intern organizations. So here you can see our members in Europe. So we have both, we have an association as member and also uh, companies are invited to join us as corporate members. This is our network. Here we have a, a dotted line to the Konarem because we have, uh, let's say, regularly information exchange. We have contacts to MERA in the United States, to PERA, and also to uh, New Zealand and South Africa. So the network of associations means we are working together in working groups or we have unregularly sessions together with other, other um, associations like VDA, the German Automotive uh, Association, APRA, as I said, ASEA Klepa, which is uh, more parts orientated, MERA, which is the organization for remanufacturing in the US, uh, we have the Rematec, the big exhibition in Amsterdam, and we have uh, especially the European Riemann Network, where Volker joins regularly the sessions. Membership benefits are access to variety of international networking events, up-to-date information on international industry topics, international political advocacy, and reduced fee for the Rematec exhibitions and for other events. So we have uh, free publicity, like listing in membership uh, directories and so on. Alliances, as I said, APRA is more or less a sister uh, association. The right to repair campaign is, a, let's say, a, a campaign where we uh, promote and uh, support. And we have the World Engine Remanufacturing Council which is from time to time, let's say, every second or every third year, there is a uh, meeting together to um, discuss international topics. And we have the Alliance for the Freedom of Car Repair, which is very important. There are some initiatives now in Europe that also independent workshops have access to uh, car data, which is essential for new modern engines you need the data from the ECU, you need the data from the car um, to enable the repair of the car, of the engine, of the gearbox and so on. So uh, we are a member of the CER, the um, European Riemann Network. Uh, Europe has a big fund, it's called the Horizon 2020, so they spend a million and billion of uh, euros for supporting the industry and also our industry gets a small share, I cannot tell how much, but it's a little bit. So there under is a CRR, ERN and uh, Council European Remanufacturer. So these are all European Riemann uh, activities, not only concentrated on engine. So it means there are also electronics repair, electronics remanufacturing, wind turbine manufacturing, um, everything which is related to remanufacturing is covered by these organizations on uh, European level. So we have a lot of challenges in uh, Europe, especially for engine uh, rebuilders and remanufacturers. We have challenge one is the uh, on-road and off-road emission regulation. Challenge two is a new definition of ownership. I will uh, tell you a case uh, called the John Deere case. Uh, we have uh, challenge three, it's the uh, EU Commission and rules for EU uh, 2016, 1628. It's a limit for um, for exchange engines. The European product compliance is also a an, an, uh, regulation which, which affects the engine remanufacturing. Um, and we have the structure of the engine remand market in Europe, which I also will show you later. So first let's go to a very, <laughs> very bad case. It's a Volkswagen case, a diesel case. I think everyone of you knows it. Uh, here you can see the drop of the diesel share in Europe. Uh, it's in Germany. So we have now only a share of 38%, uh, it was much above 50%, so it really decreased. And the uh, main reason is the discussion about the diesel engine. But this happened a long time ago. Uh, here I have a case 40 years ago. Volkswagen had the Volkswagen diesel, the Golf diesel, 
Oh, sorry. I owned also this car at that time. It was a nice car, spent less fuel and was okay with 50 horsepower. But US uh, EPA reclaimed that the NOx measures were much too high. <laughs> 40 years ago. <laughs> But this case was never, uh, never was an issue. It, it, uh, so the volume of, of Golf diesel in the US was so few, so nobody cared about that. But it happened 40 years ago. We have another uh, big uh, issue in the future. Um, everyone is uh, discussing the electric vehicle. Uh, so, um, and here are some statistics of my former company, the consulting company, Roland Berger. How much people will or are thinking about buying an electric uh, car. So and, uh, this number is depending on the country. So China is much ahead. China, the awareness of electric uh, vehicles in China is much more than in Europe. And uh, the annual growth is that I think every year more people are thinking about buying an electric vehicle. When they have enough vehicles to offer, they will buy. But today in Europe we have the situation that almost every car maker announced something, but if you really want to buy one, it's hard to get one. Then uh, the next issue is the emission and fuel consumption. Uh, here you can some, see some, uh, yeah, some changes in the... Do I have a pointer? No? Oh, here. Here you can see the drop of NOx in the last years. So it's really it's it's a reduction. It's more than 95% of reduction of emissions. So it's it's a hard target. And you see also the correlation to fuel consumption. And sometimes uh, good emissions are not so good for fuel consumption. So it's a really a technical challenge to design an engine which is fuel efficient and has low emissions. These are the new rules for off-road engines. Also, these rules are very hard. So from, from this year on, we are preparing the stage five emissions for off-road. It's nearly as hard as Euro 6D for on-road. So uh, without a complicated uh, after exhaust gas after treatment, you won't get any engine running on the road. And also next year, not off-road. So every engine which drives the machine, which drives a vehicle, has to fulfill strictest emissions in suit, in suit particle, suit uh, quantity in total, uh, number of particle, NOx measures, and sometimes also formaldehyde for gas engines. And overall, you also have to save uh, CO2, so spend as less fuel as you can. So we have some transient uh, times especially for industrial engines. Engines produced in 2018 are able to use for, let's say, the next two years, but then it's over. So at least in 2021, every engine, every new engine has to fulfill these regulations. And we also have a hard time as remanufacturer because, or maybe it's also a challenge, we can, we can remanufacture a lot of more components. Like the complete exhaust gas system has to be uh, maintained, there is a big maintenance issue. Uh, sometimes you have to exchange components, sometimes you have to clean it, you have to test it, and uh, the value of the engine, let's say the bare engine value, is the same like the complete exhaust system. That means on the other side, the engine is as double as expensive as it was before, a couple of years before. So we have very strict uh, standards, also the US uh, 2010 standards are almost the same de depending on the, on the quantity of suit, there's uh, some differentiations. But the next problem is that the in-use compliance has to be uh, guaranteed, guaranteed for the whole life cycle of the engine. So it means an engine runs 10 years, in the 10th years also the engine has to fulfill the strict emission uh, compliance. Therefore, you need mobile test equipment, like you can see here on the tractor. This is an item, it's called PEMS. It measures the exhaust, the exhaust um, of the engine, of the machine, in use, in the field. So during the harvester, sometimes the officials come, put a measuring equ equipment on your tractor, and then you have to drive. And if uh, it fails the emission, you have to stop. So 
throw your tractor away, repair it, or do something else. This will be a hard time for farmers in the future, really. Also for construction machinery. Here you see some more components, which can be a new program for our engine remanufacturers. Um, my old company, Bücker, we, had, we were the first who were remanufacturing the EGR, the Exhaust Gas Rec Recirculation System. This is very critical because you have hot exhaust gas going back into the combustion chamber. It has to be cooled, sometimes uh, with two cycles cooling. Uh, and there are some very critical materials like flaps, like uh, the cooling unit, and if you have some small leakages, the complete component fails. And um, as an example for an MAN engine, uh, two years ago this unit was uh, officially sold for 6,000 euro. Now the price has dropped and also the independent market now can offer some items uh, for the remanufacturing. So the John Deere case is in, uh, the second uh, challenge. Uh, there was a case in the US that uh, John Deere issued a new tractor with a new ECU, with a new electronic control system. And uh, then the farmers had to sign an Euler, a license agreement about using the software for the tractor. And this was quite new. Nobody understood, but I want to drive the tractor. Why, why do I have to, to sign a software agreement? Yes, I could not understand. They did. And then the first service came. Then they looked into the handbook, okay, service this and this, manual, bop, bop. I have to call the John Deere service dealer because nobody else get, could get access to the ECU, to reset the ECU, to reset the maintenance schedule. So the first maintenance was done by the John Deere service, then they discovered, oh, the prices are going up like hell. So they are charging $100 per hour, so this is not my, uh, in my budget. So they looked for alternative solutions. They found that there are some, hmm, let's say, hackers, software specialists who can circumvent the John Deere blocking, the dongle and everything. So um, this was done by some independent garages and Pharma was happy because it was quite cheaper. But then some failures uh, happened and uh, they needed again the official, the OE service of John Deere and uh, then John Deere discovered, oh, you manipulated the ECU. You did something with the software. So you are hurting the software license agreement. And this is really a hard punish. So US Americans were uh, suddenly aware that they, they are uh, illegal using the tractor, they are illegal using the software. And uh, there were some, some judges who said, oh, this is a new situation, we have to find a regulation. So then some uh, farmers uh, made a campaign. The government, some states in the USA, uh, talked to John Deere and they found, a, they found a solution. So it was not so hard anymore. But um, the problem is, it is really a legal case. And we as firm are also working in Europe that this will not happen. Okay, challenge number three, the EU Commission makes new rules for emissions for, uh, for uh, non-road non applications. And um, with this, there's also a limited use of replacement engine. Replacement engine means you take out the old engine and put an exchange engine in. If you don't use the same series number, you have a new engine. And after 10 years, you have to use the newest model. So it means then you have to use a new uh, emission compliant engine. And this is really hard. So uh, our remanufacturing uh, companies are now making, um, let's say, a repair, an overhaul. They maintain the type plate of the engine. They can exchange parts. But the engine block, some major parts have to be kept. Otherwise, it's illegal. Then you have to buy a new engine, and if you buy a new engine, you have to fulfill the newest legislation. So this is a, 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 a compromise, also uh, handled with Euromod. Euromod is the association for uh, engine manufacturers in Europe. They came to agreement with the uh, EU Commission because all the engine remanufacturers uh, manufacturers in, in, in Germany have also a remanufacturing plant. So it was, was a common interest of us as firm and Euromod to have this um, regulated. 
Okay, I don't uh, go through all the um, stage five uh, regulations, but it's a lot. Uh, these are more than 80 pages which you have to uh, fulfill. Another thing is the CE mark. Uh, every machine in Europe, sold in Europe, needs a CE mark. And sometimes if you have an old machine and uh, you uh, remanufacture this machine, it, got, it doesn't matter if it's a tooling machine or an engine, you have to keep the CE regulation. And this is very interesting, this is very important. You have to care about the newest regulations. So maybe you have an engine, 30 years old, so nobody cared about CE 30 years ago. Now you remanufacture that engine, put it back into the machine, then you have to respect the newest rules of CE. So CE is more or less a security that you have to um, take a, a maybe a belt cover that nobody can go into the running belt and so on. Um, it is sometimes easy, sometimes it's not so easy. But as a remanufacturing company, you have to be careful. So this is the market, the structure of the market. So in Europe, maybe we have the same situation like in Brazil. We have a lot of small companies which are um, um, smaller than, let's say, five people or ten people. So family-owned, family business. <coughs> they have good business, but Sometimes you need a, a, a succeeder and your son will not or your daughter will not take over the company. So this is a problem we have facing now in Europe. A lot of small companies give up because they don't have anyone who will take over the business. Um, almost Europe in our association we have more than 500 members, Might, maybe 800, but I calculate now 500 member companies. Uh, in our 10 European companies which are organized in our association. 85% of these companies are small and employ five to six employees with a yearly turnover, let's say, 500,000 euro. 10% of the, of, the, of the companies in Europe have uh, more than 20 employees. I said these are medium engine remanufacturers and they can reach uh, three, around 3 million euro. 5% employ over 100 employees with a turnover of more than 15 million euro. These are the medium and big companies. So uh, we see a change. The, the, the medium and big companies are getting bigger and the smaller companies give up. This is a market trend. We are facing this trend since five years, let's say. Since five years, this is a, someone gives up, but uh, they are not coming new companies, but uh, medium companies are coming, becoming bigger. So therefore, in firm, overall, we have estimated 4,500 employees for engine remanufacturing, with a total yearly turnover of more than 500 million euro. If we say that we have a degree of organization, so let's estimate that 35% are in associations, in the German Association, Turkish Association, and so on. Then we are saying that uh, in the 10 countries, we have a total of 1,500 engine rebuilders, and eventually further 1,000 companies outside of the 10 countries which are organized in firms. So we have more, we have 27, uh, well, later we have 27 uh, EU members. So we are talking about all over, let's say, 2,500 2, companies which are more or less uh, engine remanufacturers. In this structure, we had in all European countries more than 27,000 employees with a yearly turnover of 3 billion euros. So it's, it's a lot. It's really a lot. 85% would cover the area transport and this is mainly on-road and the turnover will stagnate in the, in the next years. And I think the 85% transport, which includes also the marine business and railroad business, I think this will change a little bit. I think it will go to 80% and 20% will be more, will be agriculture, will be uh, construction machinery and power generation. So. Um, I think from automotive to industrial engine will be a small change in shares. So it will be more industrial for engine remanufacturers than uh, automotive. 
And this is also uh, caused by the leasing and rental projects in Germany. So the ownership of a truck is, is really changing to, to I think, let's say 85% leasing and rental. And uh, to get a leasing truck or a rental truck for an engine rebuilder, it's nearly impossible because the, uh, the company who uh, leases the truck has a hand over uh, the service and so on. Okay, um, so uh, the total number in um, Germany we have around uh, 250 independent engine rebuilders with a similar structure and a complete turnover of estimated 175 million euro. Um, and we have additional 450 million euro of OEM Riemann. For example, Volkswagen has a big Riemann plant and they are remanufacturing 50,000 engines per year and 50,000 gearboxes per year. Mercedes has around 7, 7 to 10,000 engine remanufactured. Uh, I think so. Scania is not so much, Iveco not so much. But all over this, I think uh, OEs are mostly doing automotive uh, engine remanufacturing. So this is also a chance for the independent market. Uh, industrial engines are going more or less to independent uh, remanufacturers. So I'm at the end now and uh, open for discussions. <laughs>